Wayne Dowson and welcome to my Anzac Portrait series. Beside me is a portrait of a young Alex White, and Alex served with the 2nd 19th Battalion in Malaya. Alex's nickname was Snow White, and that will be the name of my Anzac Portrait, which I'm really looking forward to sharing with you all. But until then, here is part one of our interview with Snow White. Well, I was born in England, it's a place called Lewes in Sussex, the cottage on Wales Farm, and uh, Dad worked on Wales Farm. I was born in 1921, 1922, we came to Australia, to Wentworth Falls. I went to school in Wentworth Falls, left school at 14. While I was going to school, on weekends I used to have to help Dad the bricklayer and uh, he's uh, off-sider mixing up all the concrete and the cement and what have you and if I didn't if I didn't do it right or I got into trouble during the week I didn't get paid so I didn't go to the pitches and uh, after I left school I worked for a while in the garage as a grease monkey from Bowser Boy Pumping up Bowser in the old glass Bowsers and left there and went out to a place called uh, Dunny Doo, New South Wales, or Craboon, it was the nearest little place. Worked on a property there for a while, did a wheat harvest there, came back to Wentworth Falls, got a job in the local golf links, worked there. Quite a while, and then the brother we used to live in Yassi, got a, onto a dairy at Barrel, and uh, wanted me to go down with him, and so I went down with him and helped him on the dairy. Ran Barrel there. From Barrel then, because the war was on, I joined the army in 1941 and trained in Dubbo as a pioneer, which is as they call first in, first last out, names infantry engineers. And then we went, when the war, Japanese come into the war, we went to Canberra, Garden Aerodrome, and uh, we were there for quite a while, and then we had Christmas there, 41 Christmas. When we came back from Canberra into, to um, camp at Dubbo, we were put in with a heap of new intake of men that just joined up, no training. They were issued with three three rifles and the only thing they could do before we sailed was clean those rifles. On the boat we couldn't, didn't, didn't do much training on the boat. And once we got onto the isle on Singapore, likewise we went into action, all these Poor fellows had no training whatsoever. Some of them didn't know even how they had a load of rifles. I don't think they ever fired one in their life. Some were trying to take the bullets out of the clip to load the three or three and load them one at a time. Some were trying to put the clip and all in. And with the clip, it goes into a little slot and you just press all the bullets out of it straight into your magazine. We had to teach them on the run and hoped that they learnt something. But it was no fault of their own, it's a government fault for sent. They should never have been sent over. Because mm. a, lot, a lot got shot that shouldn't have been shot. We sailed to the bottom end of Sumatra on the, and the Aquitania. We changed there onto six Dutch cattle boats to go into Singapore. We got into Singapore and that boat that we happened to be on was damaged and we were the last in and we had to be pulled in sideways into the dock and it was the only day the Japanese didn't bomb Singapore. Got off the boat onto the train, crossed the causeway into Malaya to go up to headquarters, got machine gun from the air, so we left the train very smartly and then walked the rest of the way into the base. We were there, we were re-equipped again and put into our different units. 
we joined us, we were put into the second 19th. But uh, when we were put into our unit in Malaya to um, reinforce the unit, the second 19th, who had suffered 793 casualties or thereabouts, which meant that in the section I was in, we had one original second 19th chap, myself, and the other six were untrained. We were there four or five days, and air raids going over every night, and we, we were issued with beds and sheets and blankets and mosquito nets, and never, never got to sleep in them because you think you're going to bed and there'd be an air raid on, you'd have to race over to the trenches. And we got sick of that, and we took a couple of blankets and put them on the bottom of the trenches and went to sleep in the trenches. And then we, we formed into our unit and then we went up the front line then to do the rear guard action back across the causeway which was sort of, you'd be in the front line one night and the next night you'd be withdrawn through the one behind you and they'd be the front line and until we got over the causeway. Moved over to the west coast of Singapore into our positions and I was in C Company which is Garden Headquarters. And then when the Japanese decided to... Um, well, we didn't do anything for a week there. And um, even the, the 25-pound guns weren't allowed to fire for a week. And they could see the Japanese across the causeway unloading stuff. And we found out later why they couldn't... Um, fire was because it might insult the Sultan of Johor. But he got insulted when it did open up. <laughs> they pounded him. But um, then they showed us so bad that we moved back 600 yards. And um, from there we went into action that night or went forward that night get so-called B Company out, and it turned out that the ones we run into were Japanese and not B Company. And we got a, well, we lost 85 men that night, and uh, a few of us got cut off and we worked our way back into Singapore City, and then we got sent out to um, headquarters, and um, I'd been wounded. I was wounded in action because the ch chap in front of me fell and I ran straight towards his bayonet and I got b wounded in the leg because I was wounded I had to go to the RAP and be dressed which was on the other side of the camp. And when I got back the rest of the battalion that were there had been there, had gone and they'd formed up what they called X Battalion to take them into action in Bukatima. and. There was only a few of us left, so we withdrew back down for the night to form a perimeter. And the next day, everybody was leaving the camp altogether, so we left too and worked our way into Singapore again. And um, from there, we found out that what was left of X Battalion, or the 2nd 19th out of X Battalion, were forming up in the uh, Botanical Gardens. So we got out there and got a lift out there re-equipped, moved forward into a position and um, dug trenches where we were. Then um, one of our chaps, he'd uh, done a bit of reconnaissance around the area and found out there was a Japanese up in the cemetery on the side of a hill, waving to a little aeroplane that was spotting with flags signalling. We come back and we told our colonel, the colonel got his map out and sorted out just where that position was, radioed back through to the artillery. He said, now watch this. And we did. Next thing, the artillery opened up one shell, one Japanese. A lot of, lot of headstones <laughs> went. So um, not long after that, the war finished as far as we were concerned. The English had surrendered and that was it. 
Then we got the orders to pile all our weapons up and I piled mine up after I wrapped it round a tree. I don't think you'd be shooting after that. And funny enough there was a, an ambulance, one of our old ambulances there. So the boys pulled the plugs out of it, took the charge out of a few grenades down the plug holes and put the plugs back in. We never ever found out whether it fired or blew up or what. <laughs> But we're hopeful. And then we had to march into Changi, which was very slow, very long, weary trip. And um, got to Singapore, we got to Changi in the night, dark. And when we got there, they had coffee for us, which was laced up a bit. And just laid down the ground and slept. Right, we were first in Changi. We had the Jap made us live on our own rations that we had because we got some into Chingy, which wasn't too bad until we started to run out. And then you'd come down for breakfast and you might get a, a dog biscuit, an army dog biscuit. Might have a little bit of sardine on it and that was your breakfast. Come round for lunch, get another dog biscuit. Might have a bit of peach or tin bit of tin fruit on it, but only a small piece. At night time, sometimes you get a dog biscuit, that was it. Sometimes you get it with something on it, a bit of tin stuff on it, but not much. So we were very hungry. You used to look at your mate and he looked pretty good. You feel like eating him sometimes. And I was very fortunate, I had a mate that went gone into Singapore working and he came back off the party, sick, and he had a jar of Vegemite. So I used to get a bit of Vegemite on my biscuit and used to share it. But that's what it was like early in the early days until we ran out of our rations and then they started giving us rice. And the rice they gave us some bright spark in the British hierarchy in Singapore and decided there might be a siege in Singapore. So they put lime, mixed lime in it. Which are like, well, so it was, it tasted like sulphur. So the cooks used to do the best they could and wash it as much as they could to try and get it out. But even when they cooked it, it still tastes it horrible. But as the doctor said, your ticket home is the bottom of your Dixie. When you see the empty, you've got to see that Dixie empty so you can see the ticket home. And uh, I just can't remember how long we were in Changi. We'd work around the camp, we barbed wired it in, put our own barbed wire around. And uh, some of the boys used to go out of a night through the wire and get stuff off the Chinese, buy stuff for the church. Because money, they had money at that stage. And um, they used to uh, buy stuff off the Chinese outside. But then the English put a picket all around the camp to stop, stop them going out. So that ended that bit of a supply that they brought back in and um, life was pretty rugged in, in um, Changi. We had to put down, drill boreholes down for salmon and for toilets and um, with a, like a post hole digger and put them down fairly deep and uh, then I believe in the end they were digging big trenches but then they, they found out later they weren't for toilets they were for burying the dead if there was a they were going to shoot them anyway we, we left Changi and went out to Adam Park which is out near Bakatima working on this shrine and uh, 
what was it, working on there, and there was a, one Japanese he was, used to like to use the back of his sword to hit you with and cross the knuckles if you were carrying anything. And then one day the, um, he decided to walk down to the waterfront to have a look and left his sword and everything leaning up against a tree and when he come back he couldn't find which tree he left it. He never ever did find it because the Scotch people, guys working on a bridge, concrete bridge, they put it in the concrete for reinforcement. And then when they were building the steps up to the shrine, they, there was a sword buried up there for similar reason. That they couldn't get it. But um, when we finished that job, they sent us back to, to uh, Changi. We were there for a while and then eventually sent us up to the Burma Railway.